This is How to Kill a Piano, episode 17. I'm George Tate. Thanks for being here. Man, a lot has happened since we've last come together in this way, and I am frustrated, very much so, with how humans can't think logically and just get it all together and come together for a greater, better future. But I'm talking about our website. HowToKillAPiano.com has been completely revamped. It's been redone. It looks gorgeous. The folks that help work on it on it with me, thank you so very much. You did an amazing job. You can, of course, stream right there on our website. As always, the blog looks better than ever. And if you're wondering what has happened to two of the characters in the story and why they might look a little bit different or why there's two characters now that you haven't heard of before. Go to our blog at howtokillapiano.com and you can read about it. In fact, this episode, or rather this chapter that I'm about to read for you, is chapter 14. And it focuses, uh, focuses on those two characters, Scrutius and Absinthe. One of those might have a familiar ring to it, but not quite be the one you're familiar with. I made an executive decision, essentially, to change the names of two of my characters in the story and give them their own complete identity. That's Scrutius and Absinthe. In fact, I've been spending the last week or so re-recording much of the story so that those characters are now there throughout. Without further ado... This is chapter 14 of How to Kill a Piano, The Maiden. Enjoy. Most might assume that demons don't like gardening. As it turns out, demons simply despise all that sunshine that comes with it. And being outside in general. But if you give a demon a few planter boxes, and fill them with dirt and seeds to keep inside, their gardens thrive. It's their meticulous attention to detail and love for the slow and mundane that is the secret to their green thumbs. You see, demons are incredibly patient. They also love to clean and abhor clutter. You'll rarely see a messy demon. That's the stereotype of Hollywood. When you picture a demon in your mind, you might see a grotesque face. You might see a picture of a human form with horns extending out from the top of its head. You might think of the traditional devil with a long pitchfork tail. Demons take many forms. The truth is, it's nearly impossible to know when you're with one. They don't all wish us harm, of course. Some simply are biding their time, waiting for the rest of us to go away, so that they may finally leave the world at rest. Watching things grow is a delightful pastime, loved by all demons. But Scrutius and Absinthe loved it more than most. When they felt the itch, they could chop off the heads of flowers and watch them grow back time and time again. It's a rewarding pleasure, as they have eternity to play. Oftentimes, hanging the living upside down and watching it decay is better than a good book. Gardening gives a demon complete control where they otherwise lack it. And demons are thirsty for it. You see, their entire lives are dictated by others. Demons are not allowed to kill without permission. Their masters and mistresses make that call. There's a hierarchy of sorts. In the garden, they have free reign. If they wish to watch their work wither away and die, they are permitted, if they so choose. The challenge was finding the perfect location for growth. When Scrutius and Absinthe weren't working out of the van, they set up their lair inside a mausoleum, just down the road from Charlie's home. 
After all, watching Charlie was like watching paint dry. You won't know the exact moment that it will finish, but you know that eventually it will be bone dry. The mausoleum cemetery grounds were always meticulously groomed. They made sure of it. While Charlie stayed entranced at the keys of the Hazleton each night, Scrutius and Absinthe were free to return to the cemetery for an interlude between sunset and sunrise. Absinthe was always tempted to trim the hedges of the cemetery into an endless hedge maze. But Scrutius was his master. Absinthe wasn't yet permitted to do as he wished. The cemeteries also gave the intervals a place to let off steam. They get a bit restless, cooped up in the van. The tombstones played the role of their inextirpable teething toys when they weren't feeding on the treats of doorknobs. The monuments that stood around silently mourning the dead and decayed played the role of the interval's silent companions. Everyone gets lonely, even a demon. The cemetery was their playground that watched over them when they weren't enslaved to work. Inside the mausoleum, Scrutius and Absinthe lined up endless rows of planter boxes. These were filled with snake's tongue, zamiococcus, and philodendrons. The snake's tongue looked like you might expect. Long, tall, pointed green stalks that jetted straight up out of the dirt. Each Zemiococcus had tiny little leaves with waxy texture and plenty of foliage. Scrutius favored the philodendrons for their long, curving vines and large leaves. He also favored the cathedral windows. I don't mean actual windows. The less of those, the better. But rather overgrown houseplants that are also referred to as peacock plants. It's a tropical plant that thrives in low light and loves nothing more than being misted. Mr. Scrutius took a particular joy, passing the hours away misting the leaves of the greenery. Absinthe would have rather been outside in the moonlight, tending to the hedges, and watching the intervals frolicking about between plots. Well, the intervals had no mind of their own and blindly followed whoever decided to be in charge of them at the time, they could accomplish the most mundane and trivial tasks that needed to be done. They could move a pile of sand one grain at a time and never grow restless. It isn't until the mundane activities are done that they need to unwind. Even a mindless idiot can snap if they never take a break. Scrutius found particular glee in overworking his nephew Absinthe, despite having the intervals at his beck and call. He often made him perform trivial tasks that the intervals could have easily done on their behalf, and had no mind to question, care, or get exhausted. On this particular night, Screwtape made Absinthe go out and search for the supplies to build a metal box. Large enough to fit a human being, he said. When he returned with the pieces, he dragged them down the steps of the mausoleum, one piece at a time. Scrutius busied himself with his plants. What should we... What should we do about the boy? Asked Absinthe out of breath as he dragged the last piece of metal down the steps of the entranceway and across the floor to the marble workbench. The kid? He's harmless. The kid couldn't find his way out of a cardboard box if we stuffed him inside one, snorted back Scrutius, lifting a leaf of the cathedral window exposing the underside for a good misting. Is that because we'd saw off his limbs to make him fit inside that cardboard box? Absinthe squawked back, passing Scrutius a pair of garden shears. Yes, that's right, my dear nephew. Now lift the rest of that onto the bench like a good devil. Scrutius snipped a few dead leaves from the philodendron. Pester me again when you're ready. Scrutius paused and noticed one of the intervals tacking along beside Absinthe. You didn't make that poor creature help you, did you? No, sir. He's only here to ignite the fire so I may finish my work. <laughs> Scrutius put down his misting can and looked Absinthe up and down carefully, studying him for any sign of deception. Very well, then. Continue on. There's not much moonlight left before sunrise. 
Yes, sir. Absinthe fitted the band of his welding mask around the circumference of his scalp and flipped down the face shield with a snap. The interval followed him around the workshop like a well-trained dog following its owner. Absinthe reached deep into the inside suit coat pocket and removed a tool with a rounded head with an indentation in the middle. It had a handle that extended six inches from the rounded head and was on a spring mechanism that, when squeezed together, caused the tool to spark. I hate this part, Absinthe mumbled, reaching his hand down to the interval's mouth and placed his left forefinger momentarily between its teeth. Without hesitation, the interval shredded through the flesh and bone of Absinthe's finger, chewing off the tip. There was no blood. Demons don't have any to lose. Absinthe brought the tool to the tip of his finger and squeezed. Sparks shot off, and his finger instantly ignited like the tip of a blowtorch. He carefully studied the pieces of metal together at their edges. Sparks flew through the air as he moved the flame of his finger back and forth over the edges, welding them together to build a large metal crate. Once finished, the interval opened its mouth, dislocating its jaw at the back as wide as it could. Absinthe distinguished his stub onto its tongue with a sizzle. You might be surprised to note that the interval didn't once wince as if it was in any kind of pain. Instead, it purred, as if it enjoyed it. The stench of burning flesh permeating throughout the room caught Scrutius's attention. He walked over for inspection. My, my, you did quite the excellent job, didn't you, Mr. Absinthe? That stub will grow back in no time. Did you remember to weld the backside shut this time? Absinthe maneuvered the box, flipping it over onto its side to expose the back for Scrutius's appraisal. Not bad. That's some fine work you've done, Mr. Absinthe. Cordivo will be quite pleased with my work. Do you have the final piece for the door? Of course, Mr. Scrutius. Absinthe finagled the last heavy piece of metal onto the marble workbench and lifted it to its final destination to cover the opening of the box. Scrutius reached into his pocket and removed two large hinges. If I had seen it happen myself, I would have been surprised by the size of them in relationship to the small pockets they were removed from. Scrutius whistled loudly for the interval, and it came trotting across the cement floor, obediently chomping its teeth in anticipation. It stopped when its teeth met Scrutius's left hand, biting off the tip of his finger as it had done to Absinthe moments before. As the interval swallowed the flesh and bone, Scrutius grinned at the little monster and scratched the top of its head as it nuzzled up into his right hand. A bit of personal sacrifice from the both of us, so that we may have sacrifice to us in the future. Light me, Mr. Absinthe. Shouldn't you put on a mask first, Mr. Scrutius? Oh, Abby, when will you get it through that thick skull of yours? We're born of fire. Absinthe sparked the tool, and Scrutius's finger was set ablaze in a deep blue of heat. The sparks swirled up through the air, off the metal hinges, and bounced off of Scrutius's pupils before raining down to the floor of the mausoleum in a rainstorm of fire. He cackled in delight as he finished welding both hinges to the door in place. When he finished, the room went dim, and the two demons found themselves alone in the moonlight. He's growing up. I think he might be learning. He might have help. Absinthe concluded, not helping to keep his thoughts inside his own brain. The little brats do that, don't they? Never mind all that. Pass me that tool so I may put the finishing touches on our trap, Mr. Absinthe. This one? No, not that one. How about this one, Mr. Scrutius? No, you nitwit. That's a wrench. Abby, does it look like I need a wrench? I swear, if you weren't my nephew, we wouldn't be in this position and I would get everything done much, much faster. Yes, boss. Absinthe grabbed a wire brush and passed it to Scrutius, correcting the mistake. 
He snatched the tool quickly and began scraping at the metal of the hinges, grinding it down to a smoother finish before continuing to pontificate. It means he'll move out and move on and Charlie will be left to us. Scrutius flipped the door of the metal sarcophagus shut with a loud clang. I'm not sure the kid will walk away that easily, Absinthe questioned. I've been doing this a long time, Abby. Nearly as long as Charlie has. They've always walked away in time. Either they go off to live their lives, or they succumb to the end of their own. Either way, we have our contingency plan. Scrutius stroked his hand along the middle box. Gently. How long have you been doing this again, Mr. Scrutius? My dear nephew, you have much to learn. Scrutius cracked the knuckles of his fingers and began to pace the room. I suppose that depends on whose life we're measuring against. In the case of our patient, it seems I've been doing this for around a thousand lifetimes. If you're lucky, you'll get to chase him for just as long. Absinthe stared at the ground and said softly in a monotone voice, I can hardly wait. That looks about done, wouldn't you say, Mr. Absinthe? I've done some incredible work, if I may say so. Scrutius loved to compliment himself and disregard any work put in by anyone else. Demons were like that. They always took credit for the work of their underlings. Shouldn't we put the spikes in like we've done with the others? You know very well we can't kill him. That's her job. But I like the pokey pokey. The blood draining out of their body when we smash the doors closed is the best part. You do like sticking it to them. I always preferred to listen to the song of their screams. It certainly is rather disappointing when it's cut short after the life has been drained from their pathetic lifeless vessels. So it goes. If we could, we could have killed that patient a long time ago. But we must observe the prime directive. The two demons stood quietly in the room, both taking in their own thoughts. Scrutius always assumed everyone thought as he did. After all, a minion's job was to blindly follow without question. He never gave much thought to anything, or anyone else. His goal was to succeed. And if he didn't, he simply acted as if he did anyway. Loser. Failure. Responsibility. These were not words within the grasp of Scrutius's verbose vocabulary. He never failed. He could only be failed. Failures reinforced Scrutius's faith in the system. After all, it was a system he was in charge of. Any inconsistencies had nothing to do with his beliefs or the possibility that his approach might be flawed. His failures were always because of something or someone else. It was never his approach. It was never his beliefs that were at fault. Scrutius was narrow-minded. Yet otherworldly. He never adjusted his views to account for new information, and that was what allowed Charlie and the others to survive as long as they have. Absinthe, on the other hand, was a bit of a wild card. He was green around the ears and was still being groomed for his position. He mostly blindly followed along, though there was a small voice inside him that didn't exist inside the other demons. It was a voice that craved answers. It was a voice that the superiors did their best to eradicate completely. Still, it persisted. Have you ever been conned, Scrutius? My dear nephew, how could I possibly know that? I have no idea. That's the beauty of a con. A well-executed con is never realized. If you do realize it, and it's not too late to correct it, then I'd hardly be able to classify it as a con. Of course, I've done my fair share of exposing others. This, my dear nephew, might all be an elaborate con. You might not even be my nephew. Wait, I'm not really your nephew? Absence stared at Scrutius for what seemed like an eternity. Of course you are, Abby. But would it matter if you weren't? I suppose it wouldn't change our current relationship. 
I feel more like an obligation. You'd be too dumb to survive on your own, my dear Abby. Far too dumb. Come now, let's get this into the van before the moon burns out for the morning. That concludes episode 17 of How to Kill a Piano. I'm George Tate. Thanks so much for listening. Today's music was played live to tape on my Yamaha electric piano and was mostly improvised with elements mixed in of Chopin's Funeral March. If you haven't already connected with me via social media, please do so. I'm on most platforms as Think George Tate, all one word, Twitter, Instagram, etc. If you haven't visited howtokillapiano.com, go check it out because it is completely revamped and beautiful and gorgeous. You can access all of our episodes right there on the page and stream it from there. But, you know, if, you, if you're listening to this on one of your favorite platforms, that's awesome too. If you haven't dropped a review on iTunes, that would really help us out. If you haven't given us a rating on Spotify, that would help us out. On Google, that would help us out. Every review, not just five stars or whatever you want to rate us, but actually writing out a review brings more attention to this. And of course, if you can share this podcast on your own social media platforms week after week, that would really help us gain the traction and exposure that we need really to survive. If you haven't yet visited howtokillapiano.com, there's another reason to do so. In the coming weeks, we are adding and making the merch store go live, where you're going to be able to pick up some cool How to Kill a Piano swag. Now, if you do write a review, please get in touch and let us know, and I will have Charlie personally write you a thank you letter. And won't that just be cool to have a fictional character communicating with you? It's like your own personal invisible friend, except kind of visible, but not really, because Charlie's just in my head, although I suppose he's also in yours. Anyway, I'll see you the next Monday that I appear, and I hope you've been enjoying How to Kill a Piano. And remember, enjoy yourself. And if you can't enjoy yourself, find something else to enjoy. And if that happens to be another person, please get their consent first. <laughs>